Oswald Spengler's book, The Decline of the West, was published in two volumes around 1920. Its German title is Der Untergang des Abendlandes, The Going Down of the Evening Land. The West is the evening land because the sun sets in the West. Strangely, Spengler does not have much to say about the decline of the West. His book is more a philosophy of history. It's only a secondary objective to establish that the West is at the stage of historical evolution where, as he sees it, it's beginning to decline. While Spengler's ideas about history are not especially complex, they are very different from what we are taught at school and what we read in the newspapers every day. It takes a while to see things through his eyes. The book is actually quite repetitive, and this is welcome because it helps you think your way into his world view. One thing Spengler emphasises is that we should not see ourselves as living in a special time that is the culmination of all that has gone before. He rails against the terms ancient, medieval, modern, with their suggestion that there has been steady upward progress from primitive ignorance to modern enlightenment. For example, Spengler argues that what we call modern science is just a way of interpreting sense data that is predicated on a characteristic Western worldview and is not true in any objective sense. Part of the Western worldview, he says, is an emphasis on ego and the will to power. And because of this, Darwin read into nature the struggle for existence and didn't find it there. Where the Western mind sees struggle, other cultures might see, say, cooperation in the way that insects pollinate flowers. Darwin's theory is just the application to biology of characteristic Western patterns of thought. As Spengler puts it, everything in Darwin is already in Schopenhauer, and the themes are taken up again by Nietzsche and George Bernard Shaw. Spengler's main concern is to argue against the idea that Western society is the heir and successor of classical civilization. He says this is part of the self-conceptualization of the West, but is not actually the case. The Renaissance was a reimagining, not a revival of classical practices. It may have used classical motifs, but it did very different things with them. A Shakespearean tragedy, say, is a very different thing from an ancient Greek tragedy. In Greek tragedy, the protagonist is made mad by the gods, almost arbitrarily and at the beginning of the action, and his tragic fate then unfolds. In Shakespeare, by contrast, the protagonist brings tragedy on himself by his character flaws and poor choices. King Lear is not made mad by the gods, but becomes mad in consequence of events of which he is the prime author. Again, this different approach of Shakespeare reflects the characteristically Western regard for ego and will to power. For Spengler, each civilization is a thing to itself, and there is no significance to their chronological order. He sees civilizations as like oranges in a sack, each one distinct and self-contained, while their arrangement is entirely arbitrary and tells us nothing. Classical civilization formed around one worldview, and Western civilization formed around another worldview. But the fact that one came before the other is a matter of chance. It might as easily have been the other way round. This is very different from the more usual teleological narrative we get at school and in popular history books, where there is a supposed progression from primitiveness to modernity. According to this conventional view, first there were Stone Age people living in caves, then some bright spark invented agriculture, then came cities and metalwork, then there was the Industrial Revolution, and so on. One seamless story of human self-advancement. This is what Spengler argues against. In effect, Spengler takes the time dimension out of the study of history. Or to be precise, he takes the time dimension out of comparative history. This relates to something he spends quite a lot of time talking about. Spengler uses the term history for the study of things where the time dimension is important. And the term nature or we might say natural science, for the study of things that are timeless, where the time dimension is not important, or as he puts it, 
where the concern is with space rather than with time. For example, in the study of the English Constitution, we are interested in a flow of events from the Norman Conquest to Magna Carta, the English Civil War, the Bill of Rights, Chartism, Universal Suffrage, and so on. There is a sequence in which one thing led to another and the order matters. This is history. But in Newton's theory of gravitation, there is no such sequence. It is timeless. There is no chronology to it. It applies always and everywhere. It is space-like rather than time-like. This is the domain of nature or natural science. The point then is that Spengler's comparative theory of civilizations is space-like and natural scientific rather than time-like and historical. Each civilization has its own history, i.e. its own progression, but the civilizations themselves do not succeed each other in any manner. Therefore, Spengler's laws of history are timeless and non-evolutionary. They apply to every civilization, just as Newton's theory applies to every planet or every solar system. This means that the development of each civilization always follows the same pattern, regardless of the particular dates when it began or ended. So what is this development pattern? Well, Spengler sees civilizations as going through four phases, which he characterizes as spring, summer, autumn, and winter. He presents tables showing how civilizations like the classical, Western, Chinese, Egyptian, Indian, and Arab Islamic can be lined up so that similar events and historical personages occur at the same times and in the same sequence. The full sequence lasts one to two millennia. After they have completed their evolution, according to Spengler, civilizations can have a sort of arrested afterlife in which they persist in an ossified form with further development having ceased. Now, so far I have been using the term civilization for convenience. But for Spengler, civilization is actually a late stage in the evolution of one of these socio-historical entities. He characterizes the spring and summer as the formation of a culture with a particular worldview. And then the autumn and winter are associated with the attainment of civilization. So classical society, or the West, started out as cultures, and they then evolved into civilizations. In the spring-summer culture stage, society is rural and power is located in the countryside in the form of barons and their great estates. In the autumn-winter civilization stage, the society becomes urban and bourgeois and the locus of power moves to the city. A large part of Spengler's effort is devoted to establishing his thesis that classical and Western civilizations are utterly distinct and one is not the outgrowth of the other. He characterizes classical civilization as concerned with bodiliness, embodiment, corporeality, and as being close up and two-dimensional, lacking a sense of depth or extension. It was concerned with bodies rather than the relations between bodies. Western civilization, on the other hand, is concerned with relationships and does have a sense of the third dimension or indeed of the infinite. So he would say, consider, for example, classical vase painting, which shows bodies in action, but has no background, no horizon. And contrast this with Western painting, which gives the subjects a context with depth, and which, in the form of landscape painting, goes to the extreme, where depth and context take over completely. The invention of perspective, Spengler would say, was not a breakthrough for all humanity that required chronological elapsed time to emerge. It is rather a characteristic product of the Western world view with its concern for extension. The reason the Romans or Chinese didn't invent perspective is not because they were too dim to do so, but because there was no place or requirement for it in the world view of their particular cultures. This corporeality of the classical worldview, says Spengler, is why sculpture was a major modality of classical art, but did not have the same importance in Western art. Spengler also contrasts the geometry of Euclid with the Western treatment of the same subject matter. 
Whereas the classical mind thought in terms of bodies, like triangles, the Western mind thought in terms of relationships, and so invented coordinate geometry, which, Bengler points out, goes back as far as the 14th century. Similarly, the classical model of the universe, in terms of proximate crystal spheres enclosing the Earth, is a characteristic product of the corporeal close-up worldview. Whereas the Western model, in terms of stars and galaxies at vast distances in infinite space, is a characteristic product of the West's concern for extension. The Western model is not superior to the classical model or closer to the truth. It's just a different way of understanding that stems from different cultural preconceptions. So says Spengler. Spengler also derides the idea that people in classical times were physiologically incapable of seeing the colour blue. I've seen this argued very recently, but it is apparently a hoary idea that was already around in Spengler's day. It stems from the observation that blue is absent from classical art and even literature. Homer, for example, speaks of the wine-dark sea. Spengler says the physiological explanation is nonsense. And the real reason for this is that the corporealistic, two-dimensional, close-up classical artists were concerned with bodies and earthy objects whose colours are predominantly yellow, red and black. Blue is the colour of the sky and of the ethereal and expansive, as evidenced by the way the mantle of the Madonna is typically shown as blue to suggest her cosmic and unearthly nature. And these had no resonance in the classical world picture. They do, on the other hand, have a lot of resonance in the Western world picture, and hence blue is very much found in Western art. I think these ideas of Spengler's are highly intriguing and they ought to be more widely known because they would provide a valuable corrective to some of our Western triumphalism. On the other hand, while Spengler's exposition of his thesis is lengthy and quite compelling, it's mainly rhetorical and lacking in precision. He might describe the Chinese Emperor Shi Huangdi as the equivalent of the Roman Emperor Augustus, for example, but he's rather vague about what the role of the Augustus archetype is supposed to be. And he doesn't establish in detail that equivalent developments in Chinese and classical civilization followed each other in a consistent order. He presents tables lining up the civilizations, but he doesn't discuss these methodically, and so doesn't give objective criteria for establishing equivalences. He also relies very heavily on his comparison of classical and Western civilizations, and discusses the others largely in passing not systematically, but ad hoc, to bolster particular points. Some of Spengler's claims can seem to involve drawing distinctions that aren't there. For example, he calls Western civilization Faustian, referring to its emphasis on the ego confronting and mastering the world. Spengler sees the story of Dr. Faust selling his soul to the devil in return for worldly knowledge and power as a characteristically Western myth. But recent work by folklorists suggests the Faust myth, as the Smith and the Devil, goes back thousands of years to the Bronze Age. Similarly, he hails gunpowder and the printing press as characteristically Western inventions, reflecting the Western feel for distance. How very Western, he would say, to invent mechanisms for publishing information far and wide and to fling projectiles a mile or more. Yet these inventions were imported from China. Spengler might respond to such objections by saying yes, but Western civilization did very different things with the same raw material. Many civilizations might know the Faust myth, but only in the West has it become a literary and artistic obsession. Similarly, the Chinese may have invented gunpowder, but they used it for fireworks. It was the West that exploited it for cannon. 
So for Spengler, a culture forms around a set of ideas and values that are unique to it and that then emerge in its philosophy, mathematics, science, architecture and art. But in a recent book called Art and Energy, the museum designer Barry Lord argues the other way round, that technological conditions shape cultural values. For example, Lord says that early humans relied on the campfire as their primary source of energy. The experience of gathering round the campfire led to a communal culture and forms of art that included, say, storytelling. Meanwhile, classical civilization was founded on slaves as an energy source. And so its philosophical tradition justified the division into slave and free. And its art and culture glorified the militarism that was necessary to secure the supply of slaves. Many social theorists might say that Lord and Spengler are both right, since the modern view is that societies are self-reproducing, with no particular factor having primacy. In other words, a society's material characteristics reflect its spiritual and cultural values, but spiritual and cultural values also reflect material characteristics. One of Spengler's ideas that seems relevant to contemporary geopolitics is this notion that civilizations can persist in a spent state, where they have been through the full four seasons and now enter a rigid, unchanging afterlife that he calls Fellaheen society. His model here seems to be the Islamic world, which in his day he regarded as lacking dynamism and devoid of political and cultural leadership, being composed of a rural and urban peasantry, or Fellaheen, that practiced an age-old way of life and was helpless in the face of subjugation by the still-living Western civilization. He calls this society the Magian civilization, whose key contributions to world history have been the Abrahamic religions. He believes it began around 500 BC, i.e. about a thousand years before the Western, and that it has now run its course. Islam would be a late phenomenon of this civilization. Now it has become fashionable to call for an Islamic reformation that it is suggested would shake the Muslim world out of its supposed backwards fundamentalism and put Islamic society on a more rational progressive path. For example Salman Rushdie is one of those who have made this argument. However Spengler says that the founding of Islam was the Magian equivalent of the reformation and since a reformation occurs only once in the socio-historical evolution of a given culture, he would regard any further such reformation as impossible and nonsensical. Just as classical culture was focused on the body and Western culture on the infinite, so Magian culture, according to Spengler, is focused on the cavern and has a concern with magic and the imminence of spirits in the physical world hence its production of alchemy and astrology. And whereas the Western Faustian mentality believes in unending progress, encourages humans to take charge of their own destiny, and views God like the English monarch after Magna Carta as bound by his own cosmic laws, the Magian mentality is more passive. It regards human existence as a brief interlude between God's creation and destruction of the world, with humans being powerless in respect of the divinity, which is very much not bound by its own laws, but can act miraculously and capriciously, leaving humans' best option as being to submit to God's will. This idea of submission to God's will certainly describes Islam, but Spengler says the same feeling was already there in Judaism and early Christianity. If it is not a component of present Western Pauline Christianity, it is because originally Magian Christian doctrines have been entirely reframed to fit the Western world view, just as Renaissance artists saw themselves as heirs of the classical while actually doing something entirely different. This Magian mindset does persist, according to Spengler, in Nestorian Christianity, which spread eastwards and was not subject to Faustian influences. Spengler also believes the Magian culture exhibits pseudomorphosis. 
This is a geological term referring to the phenomenon whereby a crystal can grow in a cavity left by a different type of crystal that has disappeared after being dissolved out of the rock. The new crystal takes on the outward shape of the original crystal rather than its own characteristic shape that it would exhibit when growing freely. So Spengler observes the Magian culture occupies a central position surrounded by the Western, Classical, Egyptian, Indian, Chinese and Slavonic. He believes these surrounding cultures constrained its development, causing it to exhibit pseudomorphosis, i.e. an outward appearance that belies its inner nature. Nevertheless, it's hard to pin down what Spengler sees as the manifestations of this pseudomorphosis. It may be the way Christianity has taken on a Western Faustian caste that distorts the true intention of its teachings. Or it may be the way Islam brought together a mixture of Judaic, Christian and traditional Arab beliefs along with concepts from the Byzantine legal code. While this is all quite thought-provoking, can Spengler's claim that Islamic civilization has no further potential for development be sustained? Is Islam really spent and exhausted, a fellaheen society that has stopped evolving? Or is it youthful and assertive, vigorously reinventing itself as it looks set to overwhelm the tired, self-doubting, dead-end European civilization? Perhaps Islam has just been going through a bad patch and its problems are a predictable response to political, economic and social circumstances. Fear and insecurity tend to make people attracted to hardline leaders. Among Northern Ireland Protestants it led to the rise of Ian Paisley say and it's the same among Islamic peoples who feel threatened by weak economies, corrupt, ineffectual governments and geopolitical disadvantage. I have the feeling that if Spengler were alive today, he might say that what we see in the Islamic world is actually the birth pangs of a new culture, one that is currently in its Merovingian period, i.e. the period before it properly gels and begins to pass through its four seasons. The Merovingians were the barbarian warlords who took over in Western Europe after the collapse of Rome providing the bedrock on which Western civilization would form. For one thing, Islam is not inherently violent and militaristic. Although it is said to have been dispersed through conquest in the 7th and 8th centuries, Spengler argues that the spreading of Islam by the sword is a great exaggeration, and the real reason it swept through populations from North Africa to Northern India is that these populations were already part of the Magian culture and were primed to receive it. Nor is Islam necessarily backward and fundamentalist. During the Middle Ages, it was more urbane, peaceful and inventive than Western civilization. One can point to its tolerance of Jews and Christians, its contributions to mathematics, algebra, arithmetic, algorithms, and its achievements in hydraulic engineering, which fed into the development of steam power and the Industrial Revolution. So the aggressiveness of modern militant Islam and its seemingly perverse rejection of social and scientific advances may not be typical of this culture stroke civilization at all. We may be looking at a new world historical phenomenon. After all, the early Christians were equally dogmatic and fanatical, burning the library at Alexandria, for example, because pagan texts conflicted with holy scripture. In that case, just as, according to Spengler, Western culture adopted Christianity but then fundamentally reinterpreted it, so social movements in the Middle East, like ISIS or Daesh, may be applying the name of Islam to a worldview that is actually novel and contains the seeds of an entirely new Spenglerian socio-historical entity with a massive amount of history ahead of it.